Hallelujah. So, over the past two weeks, we've been speaking about value and what is your worth. Can you tell me what is your worth? What, is, what does your worth consist of? Not just a beautiful face. Because guess what? When you get old, that face doesn't... Not, it needs more cream. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right, let's not talk about the faces. So what makes us valuable is what we do with our time. So time is the most valuable thing that you have in your life. Agree? How many of you have realized, wow, at the end of the day, what happened to the time? Not many of you. I go through a lot of days and I realize, man, this day just flew past me. It's like, what happened to my time? If we don't manage our time rightly, then we can't cry about it not being long enough. Amen. And then as well, everyone watching, uh, if you're watching the, at the bottom, there's a like, share, and a comment section. And I encourage you to comment like what you feel. If you agree or something, comment with it. You will see we've launched the new show, the comment section. How many of you saw it in here? No one. All right, go check out our Facebook. It's the comment section. You can future on there. You can be a star. How many of you want to be a star? Uh, none of you. Everyone here in your house, if you want to be a star, go to the comment section. You'll see your name pop up there. But that's, yeah, just be a part of the service. It's going to be good. Ephesians 5, you can go there if you have your Bible. Do you have your Bible with you? That's great news. Do you have a book and a pen? Amen. That's even better news. Always have a notebook and a pen. God speaks on the weirdest places. I'm not going to name a few, but anyway. Ephesians 5, be therefore followers of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ has also loved us and has given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for his sweet smelling savor. Wow. If you understand what that verse means, that is enough this morning. Because he says that Christ was an offering and a sacrifice to God for who and for what for you so that you are a sweet smelling savor to god when god looks at you he sees the sacrifice that jesus paid he doesn't see your shortcomings he doesn't see your trials and your tribulations and things that you haven't achieved yet he sees you as perfect he sees you as valuable he sees you as worthy ah that's beautiful now let's jump uh, to verses 9, I think. Ah, verse 8. No, let's, let's go to verse 6. Let no man deceive you with vain words. Because of these things comes the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not therefore partakers with them, for you were sometimes darkness, but now you are in the light. Walk as children of the light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodliness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done in secret. Verse 16, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Repeat after me, redeeming the time because the days are evil. You don't have to look far and then you can realize that the days are evil. <laughs> We are living in evil days. So it's more importantly for us to buy out the time that we have. What do we do with our time that we buy out? And what makes us valuable is what we do with that time that we buy out. Hmm. Matthew 6, verse 33. What does that say? Without looking at your Bible. Bible quiz time. Okay, for 100 rand. <laughs> 200? I'm just joking. Okay. Matthew 6, 33, it says, Seek ye first the kingdom and all these things. Everything that the world is running after will be added, will be given to you. Seek first the kingdom. Now, last week we spoke on value, and uh, we were discussing this in the office, and my dear friend, the Roots, he, he just he lighted this one up for me. He says, Value first the kingdom. 
And when he said that, I was like, wow, I wish I thought of that. Because value is the emotional connection that we have to something. Value puts priority over other things. If we value something, we prioritize it over the other things. So it's not merely seeking the kingdom because the word says we must seek the kingdom. It's like looking for the kingdom. Where are you going to find the kingdom? But value the kingdom, it means it is, it is priority in your life to see the kingdom first. And all these things will be added unto you. What I find in that is if you value the kingdom, that means you are part of the kingdom. And then we get into the place where God has made you a king and a priest. Do you believe that? That means you have a higher authority than the normal folk. So value first the kingdom. And all these things will be added unto you. So buy out the time because the days are evil. You can't moan about your life not getting anywhere if you don't put time into upskilling yourself where you, so that you can get where you need to be. Time is what makes you valuable. What do we do with our times? So last week, my favorite verse, and I'm going to refer to it again, it is Psalm 8. Who can, who can repeat it with me? For what is man? That you are mindful of him. And the son of man that you visit him. Knowing that God, the infinite, the almighty, is thinking of you. Do you know how valuable that makes you? Go back to Ephesians. For Christ was an offering and a sacrifice. For who? For you. Ah, that's beautiful. So value. How do we get the value of something? It needs to be evaluated. <laughs> it's easy as that. How does gold get its value? It has to go through a process of refining. Do you know when a diamond comes out, it has blemishes, spots, it is, doesn't look that nice as what it does on your wife's wedding ring. So it has to go through a refining process. And they have to shape it. They have to cut it. They have to bring the preciousness out. Amen. Let's read Zechariah. I'm just going to read it to you. You don't have to go there. Zechariah 13 verse 7. It says, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd and against the man that is my fellow, says the Lord of hosts. Smite the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered, and I will turn my hand upon the little ones. And it shall come to pass that in the land, says the Lord, two parts the end shall be cut off and die, and the third shall be left therein. And I will bring the third part through the fire, and I will refine them as silver is refined, and I will try them as gold is tried. And they shall call on my name, and I will hear them. And I will say, it is my people. And they shall say, the Lord is my God. The Lord is my God. Guess what? A refining process isn't a pleasant one. So sometimes when you go through difficult times, guess what? You are busy being refined. Do you think that God will punish you for no reason? Have you ever been in a conversation where someone is like, now nah, God is punishing me for what I did? It's like, how would God punish you if Jesus paid the price that he was the final sacrifice so that you can be a sweet-smelling savor unto God? How can God go over Jesus and then punish you? So it's just a mindset. What makes you valuable is your mindset. So a refining process isn't always one of the most enjoyable processes there is. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, offerings and sacrifices you desire not. So Jesus became a sacrifice in our place. Now, how beautiful that is. Now, how awesome it is to know today that Jesus paid the price for anything that I've done, that I'm going to do, that I have already done. It doesn't matter because the price has already been paid. I'm going to take it personally for me, for you. So that means I have been put in an advantage. 
Hallelujah. Let's go to David, to Samuel. Praise the Lord. Brothers and sisters. 2 Samuel 23. Now, if you have a, one of these wonderful Bibles, it gives you a heading before it starts the chapter. And it says, David's last words. <laughs> so, if you think about yourself, what will your last words be? <laughs> Help! Yo, when I was younger, we used to... Um, I'm five years younger than my brothers, and I, I used to think about my last words quite often when I was driving with Corbus, because I really thought those were my last words. Yeah, man. That guy, yeah, he will make you repent very quickly. <sighs> Hallelujah, but he's better today. <laughs> Thank you, Corbus. David's last words. Now these be the last words of David, David the son of Jesse, and the man who was raised up on high, the anointed of God of Jacob, and the sweet psalmist of Israel, the sweet psalmist of Israel. We have to say thank you, David, for all the psalms that he has written. It's just beautiful. But these were his last words. The spirit of the Lord spake by him, and his word was in my tongue. And the God of Israel, the rock of Israel, spoke to me. And he that rules over men must be just ruling in the fear of God. And he shall be as the light of the morning when the sun rise, even the morning without clouds, as a tender grass springing out of the earth by clear shining after water. Although my house be not so with God, yet he has made me with an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things, and sure, for this is all my salvation and all my desire, although he make it not to grow. Then we go to, uh, to Samuel 24. So let's jump to the next chapter. Again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he moved David against them and said, Go number Israel and Judah. So David is he's busy checking out. This is his last, his last chapter. This is the last thing that he's going to do. And what happens is in verse 10. So David goes and numbers the people, and David's heart smote him after they had numbered the people, and David said unto the Lord, I have sinned greatly in that I have done, and now I beseech thee, O Lord, take away the iniquity of thy servant, for I have done very foolishly. <laughs> for I, when David was up in the morning, the word of the Lord came upon the prophet Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and say unto David, Thus says the Lord, I offer thee three things. Choose one of them, that I may do it unto thee. So Gad came to David and told him, so he gives him three options. Now, how many of you, uh, phew, I don't know about you, let's just put myself in, the, in that position. I do not want to be in the position where I've angered God, where God comes back to me and says, all right, I'm going to give you three options now. <laughs> this must be a difficult situation. I don't know, all the situations in my life together, cannot make up the situation that David is in. But what happens next is, uh, this is where I want to start this morning. But jumping back to uh, 23, to 20, uh, Samuel 23, after David starts speaking his last words, what happened was Jerusalem was, uh, it was a fortified city, and David was thirsty. So he said he just wants a drink, and his mighty men broke into a city a fortified city, just to get water out of a well that he wanted and brought it to David. Guess what David does? He takes the water and pours it out as an offering to God. The next thing, David angers God. God says, hey, I'm going to give you three options now. Choose one. <laughs> uh, where do we pick up next? Uh, verse 17. So David spoke unto the Lord when he saw the angel that smote the people and said, Lo, I have sinned and I have done wickedly, but these sheep, what have they done? Let your hand, I pray thee, be against me and against my father's house. And Gad came that day to David and said unto him, Go up, rear an altar unto the Lord in the threshing floor of Arunah at the Jebusite. 
And David, according to the saying of Gad, went as the Lord commanded. And Aruna looked and saw the king and his servants coming on towards him. And Aruna went out and bowed himself before the king on his face upon the ground. And Aruna said, Wherefore is my lord the king come to the servant? And David said, To buy thy threshing floor of you, to build an altar unto the Lord, and that the plague may be stayed from the people. And Aruna said unto David, Let my lord the king take and offer up what it seems good unto you. Behold, here is the oxen for the burnt sacrifice, the threshing instruments and other instruments of the oxen for wood. And all these things did Aruna as the king give unto the king. And Aruna said unto the king, The Lord your God accept you. And the king said unto Aruna, No, I will surely buy it of you at a price. Neither will I offer burnt offerings unto God, that of that which cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for fifty shekels of silver. And David built an altar there unto the Lord, and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So the Lord was entreated for the land. And the plague was stayed off of Israel. So if you read the previous chapter, you realize that it was the time of the harvest. When the harvest comes in, guess what happens next? Is it needs to be gathered. And then it's taken to the threshing floor. So David, he buys the threshing floor of King Aruna. For what reason? To offer unto God an offering of peace. But David understands something about God that most people don't do. God is not pleased with sacrifices and offerings. God is pleased with the condition of your heart. So when the king offered David, he says, Man, you are King David. Just take everything. Take what you want and offer, make an offering to God. But David understands you cannot give unto God something that is of no value to you. You cannot bring an offering to God that has no value to you. If we go to the old system, the law, how many times did they have to offer a sacrifice for their sins? Yearly? I think most of them should have done it daily. <laughs> if we look at the people today, they should do it daily. <laughs> but that is a repetition. That is a law system. It is of no value to you. David understood if you give something of value to God, God sees your heart. Psalm 51, this is after David, I mean, yo, he did the, the nasty and the pasty. And um, Psalm 51, it says, Have mercy upon me, God, according to your loving kindness, according unto the multitude of your tender mercies. And blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you might be justified when you seek and be clear when you judge. <laughs> Why, behold, I was shapen in iniquity. <laughs> Let's just jump to verse 16. For you desire not sacrifice, else I would have given. You delight us not in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O God, you will not despise. Do good in thy good pleasure unto Zion, and build thou the walls of Jerusalem. So David understood it is not in burnt offerings and sacrifices that God is pleased. Yet he goes and buys the threshing floor of Aruna. Why? Because it was in harvest time. What is a threshing floor? It is a, a round piece of ground where the harvest came in, the grain, and they used to beat the grain. And then they have these big forks, and then they call it the winnowing. So they throw the grain up in the air, and what happens next? The chaff gets blown away, and the good stuff falls behind. It's a refining process. So David understands that the threshing floor is a place of judgment. Even though Jesus was placed in our place, we still have that place where we need to refine ourselves. This whole year we've been speaking about your mind, about your thoughts, about building, about where you need to get, about who you need to be. But then again, every now and then, we find ourselves in a situation. <laughs> 
Hallelujah, it's just me. All right. Every now and then, I find myself in a situation where I'm thinking the wrong things. Why am I thinking the wrong things? And it's not, it's not bad, and it's not good either. It's just the process that we go through. Because there has to be a refining. There has to be a continual refining in your life. You have to understand that when the harvest comes in, you need to take the harvest to the threshing floor. All right, let's go to John 15. Amen, am I making sense? Then you need to go comment. <laughs> oh, no, I'm just advertising there. John 15, it says, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. And every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Ha. Ah. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can you except you abide in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. He that abides in me, and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. Repeat after me. Much fruit. Not one fruit much fruit so the purpose of your life is to bear forth much fruit for without me you can do nothing if a man abides not in me he is cast forth at the branch and is withered and men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned if you abide in me and my words abide in you you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you herein is my father glorified Wherein is God glorified? That you bear much fruit. That your life is fruitful. So you shall be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Continue in my love. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. And these things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. Ha! Can I see some joy? Woo. Hallelujah. All right. <laughs> your joy might be full. So this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. So if we, if we look at John 15, it says that God is the vine, we are the branches. You cannot bear fruit unless you are engrafted in the vine. He purges and he takes away that which does not bear fruit. And our mission and our purpose of life is to bear much fruit. So how is God glorified? Through our much bearing fruit. That doesn't even sound correct, does it? My grammar. You get the idea. Much fruit. If you are prosperous in bearing a lot of fruit, then God is glorified. So let's go to Matthew 13. Thank you, Father. Matthew 13. Whew. Are you there? Verses 24. So another parable he put forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while the man sleep, his enemies came and sowed tares amongst the wheat, and he went away. But when the blade was sprung up, he brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came unto him and said, Sir, did we not sow good seed in the field? Where does these tares come from? And he said unto him, an enemy has done this. The servant said unto him, Will you, when you go away, gather them up? Hmm. But he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you root also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. Just pay attention to that. 
Let both grow together until the harvest. <laughs> and I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them into the bundles, and burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. So you have to understand, when we go through our lives, there are things that grows with us. There are things that can only be separated when the fruit is matured. See, David, at the end of his life, goes to a threshing floor and he buys it. He doesn't take it for free, even though he's a king and he can get it for free. He makes sure that he puts value into something before he offers to God. And in our life, when Jesus says, the harvest time is now, what does that mean for us? What does the harvest mean to you? For some, it might mean something completely different than to others. For me, it means this place is going to be full. Stillfontein is going to see God's goodness. Yeah. Revival is going to break out. Yeah. In other senses, our finances is going to overflow. Our joy is going to be full because it's harvest time. So the, the great thing about a freshing floor is, for lack of a better example, uh, this is grain, right? So in this is seeds. These seeds are used to make bread. True? I believe most children today believe that bread is born in a, in a shop just like apples and all the other foods that we buy. They don't grow on trees. They grow in shops. But there's a process for your bread that is on the table to be there. And it starts off by seed, by grain, by wheat. So in the old days, the threshing floor made it easy for them to extract the good and get rid of the useless. When the harvest is ready, now you can single-handedly go out and pick every seed. But that is a single stalk. If you look at a harvest, you're looking at thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, or million thousands of these. You know how long that's going to keep you busy? <laughs> a ricky. So what happens is they bring it to the freshing floor, and there's a process. There's a crushing. They beat it. And separates everything. It's beautiful. I hope you're going to see this picture that I'm painting for you today. See, God gives you so much. So much word has been planted in you guys. If we look at this year, the word that has been going out, every one of you have started realizing something is growing in your life. You are starting to think differently. But with that, there's also other things that's accompanying it. I'm going to use this small example for you. How many of you sometimes feel like you are in a different space? And all of a sudden, things are quiet. It's almost like you can't hear the voice of God. Now, the secret to that is when you enlarge your tent, when you are in a different space, the way God speaks to you is not recognized because you haven't been there before. So when we enlarge our territory, we have to recognize God's voice because He will speak differently. He will use different things. So when we find ourselves in an empty space or a quiet space, it is not a bad thing. It is a good thing. When you start thinking differently, it is not a bad thing. It is a good thing because God is there. He has brought you to that place. Now thinking about a harvest, wow. Let's just say this is, our, this is our mind. This is a seed that has been planted. In this harvest is the good, but it is surrounded with useless things. So it needs to be extracted. That's why we find our thoughts sometimes. We feel that, hey, I'm in a good space, but why do I feel these blockages? Why don't I have clarity about what I need to do? It's because every now and then, you have to realize when the harvest is ready, you have to go to the threshing floor. 
you have your own threshing floor that you need to visit often. And it's not about judgment. It is about separating. It is about growing. It is about bringing in the harvest. It is about receiving what God has given to you. It is about the fruits that needs to come out. Let's go to Joel. Joel 2. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. So in Joel 2, verse 1, it says, Blow the trumpet in Zion. Who has a trumpet here? There we go. That was good. <laughs> and sound the alarm on the holy mountain. Let the, all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the Lord, the day of the Lord comes, and it is nigh. Verse 12. Therefore also, says the Lord, turn you even to me with all your heart, and with fasting and weeping and with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. And turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repents him of the evil. And who knows if he will return, repent, and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. Now verse 21. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice. Fear not, O land. Be glad and rejoice. For the Lord will do great things. If ever I prophesied, this is it for you. Fear not, O land. Rejoice. For the Lord will do great things. Be not afraid, you beasts of the field. For the pastures of wilderness do spring. For the tree bears her fruit, and the fig tree the vine do yield its strength. Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he has given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. As for me, it's quite significant that <laughs> we are here in Stolfontein. And I believe that ha, I'm here for the area that God has placed me in. And looking at January and February, man, we have had rains that I've never seen before. <laughs> so I'm taking this as, wow, God is, God is fulfilling these things right now. We are in the time of the latter rain. That means we're going to have the first rain and the latter rain together. And what happens next is the floors shall be full of wheat, and the fats shall overflow with wine and oil, and I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten, and the cankerworm, and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, and my great army which I sent unto you, and you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God that has dwelt wondrously with you. And my people, that is you, shall never be ashamed. <laughs> and you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and no one else and my people shall never be ashamed. You have to understand, God will not let you be put to a shame. I love what it says. It says, there will be restoration for everything that has been taken away. The caterpillar and the canker worm has destroyed. God will bring it back to you. Thank you, Father. And Umdwani and Tenermin, when we were singing that song, is I pour out, I just saw your faces. You have poured out so much in your lives. And it's not for nothing. God is about to restore. God is about to bring back God is about to fill your bonds Amen. and make your, give you new wine. Come on. But we find ourselves every now and then in the freshing floor. And guess what? It's not a pleasant experience. 
How many of you have felt that just this year? This year isn't even long. But you've already felt the crushing, the pressing. But it's not a bad feeling because you know something's busy happening. You have to understand when you look at a stalk of grain, there are things that is useful and there are things that is not useful. That's why I'm saying we have to continually renew our minds. Romans 12. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why do you have to renew your mind constantly? Why does Paul so many times say renew your mind? Daily, it's a daily thing because our thoughts, it's just like a grain. It is birth and it gives forth fruit. And the fruit is surrounded by the husk. Is it a husk? It's, the, it's not a pleasant thing to eat, right? No. So I want you to understand this morning, there is a process that needs to take place in your life. And only you, you and only you can do that. Beautiful thing about it is, for lack of a better example, this is a precious spices called pepper and some shredded money just to resemble what happens in the threshing floor. And it's not, just, it's not just you going in and just banging your thoughts against the wall just to make sure that everything is separated now. What happens is when we pay attention to what we've been thinking, if we continually meditate on the word that has been given, it says meditate on the word, meditate on the precepts of God, meditate on these things day and night, so shall you be prosperous. So what happens when we go to the threshing floor? Ha! Huh? When everything is beaten, when your life feels like this. Sometimes your life feels like this, right? I felt it before. It's like I went through a shredder. <laughs> but then the beautiful thing happens is the Spirit of God comes and breathes. And what happens is you are left with the precious, with the useful. If we don't let the Spirit of God breathe on us, our usefulness means nothing because it's surrounded with useless things. See, every one of you has the power, has the ability to do anything. But your grain is still stuck in the whole husk. It's not been separated yet. That's why when we come to a morning like this morning and we have someone that leads us in worship, you can feel the breath of God just blow through the house. You know what that means? Is when you walk out, you feel lighter. Why do you feel lighter? Because the chaff is blown away. He says the kingdom of heaven is like an, to a man that goes out and sows good seed. The previous parable, right before that, he says... A sower goes out and sows. Some falls on rocky and other falls on good soil. What is he talking about? The seed is the word. You are the ground. Do you know that when God talks about harvest, he talks about you. You are the harvest. So have that in mind, and then I want to say again, Fear not, O land. Be glad and rejoice. The Lord is about to do great things. <laughs> Be not afraid, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring, for the tree bears her fruit, for the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. Be glad, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For He has given you the former rain moderately, and He has caused to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. And your floors shall be full of wheat, not of chaff, <laughs> not of useless things. Your floors shall be full of useful things. Ah, oh, Jesus, thank you.
and your vats shall overflow with wine and oil, and I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten, and the canker worm, and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, and my great army which I sent amongst you, and you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. You are going to eat in plenty and be satisfied, meaning there will be no lack. Plenty means you don't have to go out and, and quickly pick some fruits in order to have food. Plenty means you go into your house and you open the cupboard and everything that you need is there. Plenty means not making a plan to get what you need. It means taking what you have out of a surplus. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that has dwelt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. You shall never be ashamed. Never, never ever, never shall you be found ashamed. Because God, <laughs> God is busy sending the rain upon your life. Holy Spirit is busy breathing upon you. As I'm speaking, just let the Spirit minister to you. Ah, oh, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. So this verse is going to be repeated over and over this year. Who are you when God is mindful of you? What is the thoughts that God has towards you? What is the thoughts that you have about yourself? You have to understand that Jesus was placed in our place. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him. So when we look at the threshing floor and we look at the judgment of it, it is not bad because we cannot be just. Jesus has already been judged for us. But when we get to that place, when we get to that place of crushing, it is for a separation of good and useless things. And we extract the valuable into our lives. You are valuable. You are precious to God. This world is waiting for you. You know, the world is also waiting for the harvest. Guess who is the harvest? You. We always think we need to get the harvest. Nah, we are the harvest. 